أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبيه الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه المعين أما بعد الحمد لله و praise Allah عز وجل we ask His blessings and His توفيق for the start of this series and to begin we want to give you a little bit of an intro as to what uh, we are planning and what we are thinking about. In the next couple of weeks, inshallah, we are going to be sharing some verses and passages of the Qur'an. Specifically, I want to look at Qur'anic supplications, various uh, prayers and supplications that appear in the Qur'an. In order to learn the beauty and the wisdom and the words of Allah and in order to extract gems and insights into what dua is and what should be our orientation, what should be our manner, what should be, what is it that we should be asking Allah so that there's so much that we can learn from the different passages in the Quran that are concerning the idea of dua. And I'm going to be sharing insights from one particular book that I highly recommend. It's in English, it's in Arabic, and I believe it has been translated into English. The Arabic book is Fanna Dhikri wa Dua, The Art of Remembering Allah and the Art of Dua, by someone I consider one of my teachers, the late Sheikh Muhammad al Ghazali, rahimahullah ta'ala, who was an incredible, incredible scholar who was a man of, of tremendous faith and unmatched commitment to the deen who spent many years of his life in prison because of his commitment to Islam. Someone of great spirituality. He, his books are filled with spirituality, ruhaniya, And he is truly someone who followed in the lines of Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala is always sharing his wisdom and insights. So Shaykh Muhammad al-Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala and he died recently in our lifetime. Uh, I met him once and I consider him a teacher. Um, I've benefited immensely from his works. He has this beautiful, beautiful book on the art of dhikr and dua. So I'm going to share with you uh, throughout the series, some of the insights and lessons that he um, shares in that particular work on the idea of supplication and dua. And every single week we will look at one passage in the Qur'an and look at one dua from the Qur'an and learn what it is that we can learn from that particular passage. This particular week we're going to look at being that we just came out of the month of Dhul Hijjah. Many of us, including myself, we came back from the Hajj about a week and a half, two weeks ago. And coming out of Hajj, there's a passage in the Quran that speaks about Hajj. The famous passage in Surah Al-Baqarah, where Allah speaks about Hajj. وَأَتِمُّ الْحَجَّ وَالْعُمْرَةَ لِلَّهِ الْحَجُّ أَشْرٌ مَعْلُومًا Specifically, Surah Al-Baqarah, you can say the passage begins with verse 197 and goes through verse 202. So in that passage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and I'll share with you just a portion that we're interested in, which is the end of that passage. Allah speaks about Hajj, and in the end of the passage He says, فَإِذَا قَضَيْتُ مَنَاسِكَكُمْ When you have completed the rites of Hajj, فَإِذَا قَضَيْتُ مَنَاسِكَكُمْ فَاسْكُرُوا اللَّهَ كَذِكْرِكُمْ آبَاءَكُمْ أَوْ أَشَدَّ ذِكْرًا Then remember Allah the way you remember your forefathers. And even more than that. And then Allah says, فَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا وَمَا لَهُ فِي الْآخُرَةِ مِنْ خَلَابِ There are some people who raise their hand and they ask Allah, O oh Allah, give us from this life. They ask for things in this world and they have no share in the next life. 
And then Allah said, وَمِنْهُ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَا وَقِنَا عَذَابُ النَّارِ أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمْ نَصِيبُ مِمَّا كَسَبُوا وَاللَّهُ سَرِيمُ الْحِسَابُ On the other hand, there are some people that raise their hands and they ask Allah, O oh, our Lord, give us the best of this dunya and the best of the next life and save us from the punishment of the fire. And these are people who have earned what they have earned. And Allah is swift to take people to account. This is the passage we're going to be discussing today. So to begin with, I want to share with you the introduction, just the muqaddimah to dua of Shaykh Muhammad al-Ghazali rahimahullah. He said, we'll share bits and pieces from his book. Today I just want to share this idea. Shaykh Muhammad al-Ghazali says that there are two obligations in each and every one of us. All human beings and believers, there are two great obligations upon us. Number one is called ma'rifah. That is the obligation to know Allah, know our Creator, know our Lord. We have to know Him. We have to know who He is properly. That's the first obligation. And the second obligation is not only to know Him, but you have to take that second step. And that step is to submit to Him, to bring our life in conformity with His commands. So not only do we recognize Allah, we know Him, ma'rifah, but the second obligation is called ubudiyah. We worship Him, we submit to Him. We submit to Him and we worship Him. The first obligation, ma'rifah, what, what does that require? It requires thinking, it requires our mind, our intellect. What does the second obligation require? It requires something Shaykh Ghazali calls adab. So, one thing is to know Allah, know that He exists, recognize Him, and understanding that He is the Creator, the Sustainer, the Source of all life. But the second step is that once you recognize that, you recognize your obligation to submit to Him. Now that requires specific steps. It requires changes in your life. It requires you to do certain things. And that idea of disciplining your life and doing certain things with your life, part of that is called adab. Adab is decorum, adab is etiquette, adab means to do certain things in the way they're supposed to be done, like physically. So, to go from ma'rifah to ubudiyah, to go from this first step of ma'rifah, knowing Allah, to the second step of submitting to Him requires adab. It requires adab. It requires this idea of discipline. It requires this idea of conformity, of doing certain things, of coming to Allah with certain, in a certain manner, in a certain way, with a certain decorum. And that whole discussion, du'a has everything to do with that, because du'a is about other. Du'a, we have to understand how we make du'a. What are the things we should be asking? What are the manners of du'a? What are the, the, what's the mindset, what's the mentality we have when we make du'a? So this is the preamble I want to share with you. It's very, very important. So we are discussing du'a, not ma'arifa, that's the introduction. But we're talking about the second half, submitting to Allah through du'a. And du'a is something very, very powerful, something very, very important. So with that, let's look at this passage in a little bit of detail. So as I mentioned, and as I translated to you, verse number 200. We are going to be looking at verse 200, 201, and 202, Surah Al-Baqarah. So in verse 200, Allah says, when you have fulfilled your rites and rituals of Hajj, فَإِذَا قَضَيْتُ مَنَاسِكَ So the word I want you to focus on is manasik. So there's some deep, deep insight you can learn from the order here in this verse. When you have fulfilled or you have completed your rites of Hajj. What are the rites of anyone who's been to Hajj, or you read about Hajj, or you've been there? There are specific things we're required to do. There's a Tawaf al Qudum, there's Tawaf al Ziyarah, there's uh, pelting the pillars, and then there's sacrifice, there's shaving of the head. There are a number of rituals that we need to perform in Hajj. 
So Allah said, when you have completed the rituals, فَذْكُرُوا Remember Allah. Dhikr. So here, first there is manasik, rituals. And second there is dhikr, remembering Allah. And then the next verse we shared about فَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا What is that verse about? It's about dua. There are some people who ask for Allah for things of this world. And there are other things, people that ask Allah for the best of this world and the next life. So there are three things here that you need to think about. Rituals, manasik, the dhikr, remembering Allah, and then dua. Dua, asking Allah. So this order is so profound and teaches us so much. Imam al Razi, Fakr al Din al Razi, he says, and he's very insightful in some of these connections and insights in the Quran. In his tafsir, he says, وَمَا أَحْسَنَ هَذَا التَّبْدِيلِ What a beautiful order this is. This order, this tartib. What is the tartib? Rituals, dhikr, and dua. So the rituals of worship, the idea of remembering Allah, and the idea of making dua. And he says, فَإِنَّهُ لَا بُدَّ مِنْ تَقْدِيمِ الْعِبَادَةِ لِكَسْرِ النَّفْسِ وَإِزَادَةِ ظُلُمَاتِهَا He said the most important, the first thing you start with is this idea of rituals or worship. And what is worship? Worship is where you discipline yourself and you humble yourself before Allah. You do things that Allah commands. So in other words, you're humbling yourself you're breaking yourself before Allah as a You're bringing yourself to your knees. That's what rituals are. In Salah, we just prayed Maghrib prayer. We literally brought ourselves to our knees. And we brought our head down onto the ground. That's not something you normally do. It's not part of human life. It's only in worship you do this. In normal life, you don't go around falling down purposely, on purpose. You don't bring your head on the floor. Floor is not something you put your head on in general. Floor is considered dirty where your feet are, not where your face is. So you don't do this normally, in normal circumstances. Putting your face on the ground or bringing yourself to the knees. You'd rather be standing. If you have the ability, we like to stand, we like to walk. We're in control of ourselves. So in the normal circumstances, we're independent. We do things that we want to do. But manasseh, or rituals, is Allah's idea of humbling ourselves. He asks us voluntarily for us to discipline our nafs, to break ourselves before Allah, to bring ourselves to the knees, bring ourselves down. And literally is bringing ourselves down. You go in Rukur, you, you, you bow down. And then you go into Sajda, and you bring your entire body down. You're on your knees, and your face is on the ground. So, the ibadah, and, you know, if you just think about the connection here, the ibadah is meant to humble you, to bring you down before Allah, to bring you to your lowest point, to break you. And it's an illusion to breaking your nafs, breaking your desires. And what do you do next? What's the second thing after manasik? The second thing is dhikr. How does dhikr fit in? So Imam al-Razi said, ثُمَّ بَعْدَ الْعِبَادَةِ لَا بُدَّ مِنْ اشتغال بذكر الله تعالى بتنوير القلب After you bring yourself down to the lowest point, you break yourself and you're this point of vulnerability, that's the best place to remember Allah, to make dhikr. Because when you make dhikr, now the light of Allah enters upon you and you become elevated. No doubt dhikr is the greatest. وَلَا ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ the greatest thing in our life is the remembrance of Allah. So when you're in your most physically vulnerable state, that's where you remember Allah because Allah wants you to break yourself, bring you down, so that He can raise you up to the dhikr of Allah. That's why the manasik are always followed by dhikr. Because now dhikr comes from the heavens, it's the remembrance of Allah, where now Allah elevates you beyond the heaven, brings you to the, the maqam of the angels. So the ibadah, you bring yourself down, and dhikr brings yourself up. And then Imam al-Razi has dua fitin. He says, ثُمَّ بَعْدَ ذَٰلِكَ الْذِكْرِ He said, after that dhikr, 
now comes dua. How and why? Because now that you are in this vulnerable state, and now you're remembering Allah and Allah is bringing you up through this process of humbling you and then bringing you up, now you're in a state of vulnerability combined with steadfastness. You're in a state of, you know, coming down along with being elevated. It's like a very intimate moment. This is a moment that paradoxically teaches you what life is. You know, this is the moment when you bring yourself down then you remember Allah. This is the moment you're the closest to Allah. That's why we know أَقْرَبُ مَا يَكُونُ الْعَبْدُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ وَهُوَ سَاجِرُ The closest you are to Allah is when the servant is in a state of prostration with the head down on the ground. So manasik humbles you, breaks you because that's the best state before Allah. And that's the closest you are in that intimate broken state to Allah in a state of vulnerability. That's why you remember Allah. Allah, because you're following His process, now He's elevating you. And in that great moment of vulnerability combined with this sublime state, what's the best thing you can do? The fruit of all of this is to ask Allah as a judge, to make dua to Allah, to ask Him for your needs, ask Him for your, uh, you know, ask Him for things in this life and in the next life. So dua fits in perfectly. Dua is the fruit of all of this. So the fruit of worship is dua. The fruit of the rituals is dua. And that is why the sequence is very, very important. It's so profound. And that is why if you look at all the rituals in the Quran, all the rituals that Islam teaches us, this is the sequence. You worship, and after worship you remember Allah. And after that you make dua. So, in this passage, for instance, this passage is speaking about Hajj. There are many, many verses we skipped over. They're giving the details of Hajj. What's the end conclusion of the details of Hajj? Dua. The last thing is Dua in this passage. And the same thing, if you look at any other ritual of worship in the Quran, you find the same sequence. So, if we look at, let's go through, just to give you, okay, if this pattern fits, let's look at the ritual of, there's five pillars, right? Hajj is one of them. Before Hajj, if you go in reverse order, is what? Fasting, right? Fasting then Hajj in, in the order that we remember. What does Allah say about fasting? The verses that speak about fasting give you the rules, the rituals of fasting. You know, That passage, towards the end of that passage, Shah Ramadan al-Adhi unzila fi Quran, What's the last thing Allah says at the end of those rules? So now complete the ritual of fasting, complete the days of fasting, and then make takbir of Allah. What is the takbir of Allah? Think. Even in this passage, all the rules, when Allah uses the idea of completing Ramadan, wali tukminu idda, the very next thing, wali tukabbiru Allah ala ma hadaku. And then remember Allah by saying the takbirat of Eid on the day of Eid. And who knows what's the next verse? The very next verse, yes, brother. Very next verse, Dua. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّارِ إِذَا دَعْوَةً When my servant asks about me, know that I am near. I respond to the, the person who is calling upon me. So even if you look in the verses of fasting, you have the same thing. All the rituals, the manasik, the rules, followed by dhikr, followed by dua. What is the verse about? There's so many verses about Salah. It's verses about Salah. Innani ana Allah la ilaha illa ana fa'budni wa aqim salata li dhikri. Same exact thing. Allah says, Know that I am Allah. No God besides me. So worship me and establish the Salah, the ritual of Salah, li dhikri and remember me, so that you can remember me. So even in Salah, 
Salah is followed by dhikr. That is why we know the Sunnah of Salah. That's another topic. But after Salah, what do we do? The Prophet ﷺ taught us Adhkar. After the Salah, he says, Salaamu Alaikum, Salaamu Alaikum. Then what do you do? We make SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, all the different Adhkar after the prayer. That means after the manasik, after the ritual of Salah even, you follow by dhikr. And then it's followed by dua as well. And we, that's why we make dua after our prayers. So this is a beautiful, beautiful insight from Imam Razi. And it's actually Islam. This is what really our religion teaches us. And it's really the manasik followed by dhikr. So our ibadah, then dhikr, then dua. That sequence is very, very important because this teaches you your orientation to Allah. We worship Allah by humbling ourselves, breaking ourselves before Allah, lowering ourselves before Allah, bringing ourselves to our knees, putting our heads on the ground, and in that broken, vulnerable state, we follow that by remembering Allah. And remember, through the remembrance of Allah, Allah raises us up. And in that state, He wants us to call upon Him and make dua to Him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, keep this in mind. Every time you worship Allah, remember, that in the end, it's always about remembering Allah and making dua. So with that insight in this passage, now we can look at the dua itself. So every week we're going to learn about dua. We're going to learn what we learn from these passages, these beautiful, uh, um, these passages filled with wonderful insight uh, that can only come from the kalam of Allah Azza wa And then the dua itself. What is the dua? So here in this passage, فَإِذَا قَلَيْكُمْ مَنَاسِكُمْ فَذْكُرُ اللَّهَ كَذِكْرِكُمْ آبَاءَكُمْ وَشَدَّ ذِكْرُمْ So this, this dua that we learn here, what is the dua? رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنًا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنًا وَقِنَا عَذَابًا نَا Our Lord, give us the best in this life, give us the best in the next life, and save us from the punishment of the Alpha. So this dua, is probably the most comprehensive du'a we have. Because this kind of covers everything that you can think of. This du'a is jamming, it covers everything. And that is why Allah shared it in the Qur'an at the end of Hajj. Hajj is kind of like the last of the five pillars. You have five pillars of the deen that make up our religion. The last one and the conclusion and the one that summarizes all the pillars is Hajj. And that is why in the last pillar, Hajj teaches you how to be a Muslim. It completes the entire religion for you. And that's why Allah says on the day of Hajj, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمْ إِسْلَامَ دِينَ Allah says today. He used the word today in the Quran. And what was that day? It was the day of Hajj. And the Prophet was making Hajj. The only Hajj that he made, Hajjat al Allah revealed one of the last verses and Allah said, Today, this day of Hajj, I have completed it, me, completed my favor upon you, completed this ni'mah upon you and chosen for you this deed. So Hajj is, has a sense of finality, sense of conclusion. It's the last of the five pillars, it's the last break in the building of Islam, the last pillar in the building of Islam. And uh, the fact that in the Hajj, the verses of Hajj, the du'a that Allah teaches us at the conclusion of Hajj is this du'a that tells you everything. This is the most important, the most comprehensive du'a that we can make uh, in uh, our lives. So if you reflect over the meaning of this du'a, so first of all Allah says, when we have completed the manasik, remember Allah the way you remember your forefathers. So, what does that mean? That means that Hajj is something that predated Islam, something that came from Ibrahim So even before the Prophet some of the Mushrikeen of Quraysh, they were performing Hajj. So when Allah revealed these verses, Hajj was still in process, and Allah was correcting what they were doing in the Hajj. So in the Hajj, what they used to do so first of all, if you think about du'a, right, there are different possibilities of du'a. You can make du'a for your dunya alone. 
You can make dua for the after Allah, or you make the dua for dunya and after. That's the three possibilities when it comes here. And there are people that follow all three patterns. So the first prototype, making dua for dunya alone, or being concerned about the dunya alone, that was personified by the Mushrikeen of Quraysh. Many of them didn't believe in the Akhara. Or if they believed in it, it wasn't a significant part of their life. Everything was about their life, their tribes, their honor, their wealth, their, uh, you know, progeny. That was their life. In their discord, there was no discussion of the effort. So, in Hajj, what did they used to do? These mushrikeen, who were part of the first pattern, only concerned about dunya, not Akhara. They used to brag with each other. They used to have boasting rallies in the Hajj. In Mina, Mina where the tents are, where now we go there, we remember Allah, we pray, things like that. At that time in Mina, they would conduct business, and they would just brag, uh, and just boast, and just have like these, uh, it's kind of like today, it would be like, you know, uh, rap sessions, where each person comes out and brags about where he's coming from, who his forefathers were. And actually, if you look at the poetry of that time, there are Sabar Mu'allaqa, the Sabar Mu'allaqa, the seven hanging poles. So what were the Sabar Mu'allaqa? They would have these poetry sessions, poetry jams, in Mina, in the Hajj season. And different, the best poets from each tribe would come, and they would start talking about their tribe, and who they were, and how great they were, and their honor, and this and that. And the seven best specimens of Arabic at that time would be chosen, and they were, they were hung in the doors of the Kaaba. They had everything to do with the Hajj. So these are the seven uh, hanging oaths. Now the reason they're important in Islamic tradition is because the Qur'an was revealed in that language. So to understand the language of the Qur'an, one of the great sources is this poetry from that era. The poetry from that era teaches us how Arabic was used, and you know, when Allah uses certain expressions, He chose the language of that time. And the best example of the language of that time were these hanging poets, these poetry. And if you look at this poetry, they're a great, you know, poetry, but it's all about the dunya, nothing else. So by, you know, I can kill this many men with my eyes closed, with my sword, and things like that, that, that kind of poetry. And, you know, I'm the one who even people remember me from far, far away, they can't see me. Things like this, all bragging, it's all about the dunya. So this was the people in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. So Allah revealed, فَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ كَذِكْرِكُمْ آبَاءَكُمْ أَوْشَدَّ الْإِكْرَامِ After you perform the rites, remember Allah. The same way you remember your forefathers and your tribes. But actually remember Allah more than you remember your forefathers and your tribes. Because Allah was correcting this, this, this type of... And He says, that's why the next verse says, فَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَا يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي these type of people, there's type of people that when they make dua, they only ask Allah for more of this dunya. More wealth, more children, more horses, more camels, more resources. This is what they ask for. But then Allah said there's another type of people. So this is the first prototype of asking Allah for this kind of stuff. And if you look at the books of Tafsir, they're filled with the dua that they used to make. Uh, Ibn Abbas, for instance, says, كَانَ قَوْمٌ مِنَ الْأَعْرَابِ The people of Arab, the Bedouins, يَجِيبُونَ إِلَى الْمَوْقِفِ They would come to Arafat and Mina, and فَيَقُولُونَ أَلَّهُمَ جَعَلُوا عَامَ غَيْثٍ وَعَامَ خَطْبٍ وَعَامَ وَلَادٍ حَسَنٍ لَا يَذْكُرُونَ مِنْ أَمْرِ الْآخِرَةِ شَيْئًا Ibn Abbas says, these people would come to Mina and Arafah and they would make these types of du'a. Allah, make this a year of rain, a year where there is no drought. Make this a year where we're blessed with many children. Make this a year of this and that. But they would never mention the Akhir. And that is why Allah corrected them and Allah revealed the verses the way that they were revealed. So that's one prototype, asking Allah only for this dunya. Now another type of person that exists in the world is 
the other side where you only ask Allah for akhirah and nothing in this dunya. You want nothing from this dunya, you only want the akhirah. So this, although it sounds good, it can go in a wrong direction. And that direction is also corrected in the Quran. Uh, who were the people that went in that direction? They were the monks in the monasteries who followed the Christian faith, predominantly. So some of them, they gave up this life, uh, they refused to marry, and to this day, you have many in the Catholic Church, the priests and the clergymen, many monks, uh, even in other faiths, they live in monasteries, they don't have jobs, they don't have uh, families, they don't get married, they don't participate in this life. And Allah says this is called Rahbaniya. The monks are called Ruha. So the idea of monasticism is called Rahbaniya. Allah says about that, وَرَحْبَانِيَّةٍ اِبْتَدَعُوهَا مَا كَتَبْنَاهَا عَلَيْهِمْ إِلَّا بِتِغَارِ ذُوَانِ اللَّهِ فَمَا رَعُوهَا حَقَّ لِعَيَتِهَا Allah says this monasticism of just focusing on akhirah and not participating in the dunya in any way, we did not prescribe this for them. This is something they went in that direction on their own. So, those are the two extremes. Pure materialists ask for everything only about this life. And then the people who reject this life, and they're only into the akhara, without participating in this life or doing anything in this life. So, the balance is in the middle. And Allah presents this model in the middle. And Allah gave this beautiful dua. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنًا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنًا وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ So this is the prophetic way, this is the Qur'anic way. Qur'anic way is that Allah gave us this light. Allah put us, this, put us in this dunya for a purpose. And we are to participate in the dunya with limits. Allah gave us the limits, Allah gave us the guidance. And we know this is a temporary abode. This is just like a temporary abode and we're going to the next life. But the entire next life will be determined on what we do in this life. So as Muslims, as believers, we participate in this life. One time the Prophet wasallam, and his hadith is authentic, um, he visited a man who was sick. And he was so sick that he was skinny. And the hadith says he was so skinny he looked like, like a bird. Like in terms of how like he had no flesh on his bones. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Do you not make dua to Allah for afiyah? Do you make a dua to Allah for afiyah? And he says, kuntu akul. He said, This is the dua that I made. This is man who was so skinny and he was on his deathbed. He says to the Prophet ﷺ, uh, The dua that I make is, Allahumma ma kunta mu'atibi bihi fil akhirati fa'ajilhu li fil dunya. Oh Allah, whatever punishment you have determined for me in the akhirah, give it to me in this life. So this man had his own thinking, right? So he, he was making particular dua, Oh Allah, whatever punishment I'm going to be getting in the next life, instead of akhirah, give it to me here. I'll bear it here, I don't want it in the akhirah. So it sounds like, think about it, it sounds like, you know, it's maybe not too bad, but the Prophet what did he say to him? He said, you know what, you won't be able to bear that. It's not something you should be asking for because you cannot bear it. And what did he say to him? Should, rather you should be saying this. What did he teach him? Allahumma atina fi dunya hasana wa fi akhirati hasana wa qina adhanu naam. He said, rather you should ask Allah to give you the best in this life and the best in the next life and to save you from the punishment of the fire. So this is how the Prophet used to teach uh, his companions and people around him. So it's very, very important that this is a comprehensive dua that covers everything. Anas ibn Malik Qatar, the great Tabar, he asked Anas ibn Malik a question. He asked Anas ibn Malik, Ya Anas, uh, he asked him, what was the most common dua that you heard the Prophet ﷺ say? He said, 
اي دعوه كان يدعو بها النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم اكثر what was the dua that was most frequently uh, made or uttered by the Prophet And Anas ibn Malik, he said in his hadith in the Sahih Muslim, he says, كَانَ أَكْثَرُ دَعْوَةٍ يَذْرُ بِهَا يَقُولُ اللَّهُمَ آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنًا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنًا وَقِنَا عَذَابِ النَّارِ He said, what he is to ask for most is this dua. آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنًا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنًا وَقِنَا عَذَابِ النَّارِ and it is said, Anas ibn Malik himself, every time he wakana Anas, and wakana Anas, ida rada yadru bi da'watin da'a biha. Whenever Anas wanted to make dua, this is a dua he made too. Following the footsteps of the Prophet, who was following the footsteps of the Quran, what the Quran was teaching him. And then, fa ida rada yadru bi du'a'in da'a biha fi. When Anas wanted to make, a dua, make dua, or something else, then he would always include this dua. So, what does that mean? It means that Anas, whenever he made dua, sometimes he just made this dua. That covers everything. He didn't ask for other things. But when he wanted to ask for other things, then he would just include this dua and ask the other thing. Um, Thabit al Bunani came to Anas and he used to say, Udur Lana. So, when they used to come to the companions, like we do to pious people, we ask people to make dua for us, right? Whenever we, feel, we see an elder, he says, please make dua for me. Or yes, he see an imam, and so on and so forth. So Thabit al Bunani, the Ritabar, he came to Anas, he said, Udur Lana. So he said, he asked Anas, oh Anas, make dua for us. What did Anas say? Allahumma atina fi dunya hasana, wa fi al-akharat hasana, wa qina adab Allah. That's the dua he made for them. But then they said, they weren't happy, they were like, Zidna, no, make dua for something else. So, Fa'arata, Anas made the same dua. Then they said again, no, make dua for something else. And Anas repeated that. And then the third time, uh, Anas said, Ma turidun, what do you want? Qad su'altu lakum khaymat dunya wal akhara. Ask for you the best of this life and the best of the next life. What more could you ask for? What else could you want? This includes everything. So this is a very, very comprehensive du'a. So this du'a just covers everything. Like sometimes you're tired, you can't think of the specifics. This is a wonderful du'a. It's a du'a that teaches us many things. It teaches us, you know, so much. It teaches us that the believer, he lives in this life, but he lives for the next life. So it's not that this life and the next life is equal, it's definitely not equal. It's not half-half. It's just this life is all that we have, do our work, and this life we're using it to build a real life for the next. So that's why we ask for the best of this life and we ask for the best of the next life. What is the best of this life? So, you know, there are different ideas. So you might think, okay, when you ask for Adana Fit Dunya Hasana, the best of this life, it probably means wealth, or worldly possessions. It could mean that. But there are many people in Hassan al Basri, he says it means al ilm wal ibadah. The best of this dunya is what? Knowledge and worship. So when you're saying Atina fi dunya hasana, you're really saying, oh Allah, give us knowledge, give us worship. So it's not necessarily for wealth, but it also includes wealth. Other companions, they said, no, it means health and wealth. You know, afia and mal and all of those things. And you know, so there are different ideas, people have different conceptions of what it means. Khair al-dunya, khair al-akhara. Khair al-akhara, no doubt. The best thing in the next life is Jannah, paradise. So that almost everyone agrees on. Of course, that's the best thing in the next life. But then you can add to that, like, safety from hellfire, uh, safety from being fearful of the Day of Judgment, having the Day of Judgment go smoothly for you, all those stages of of Barzat and akhara for the believer, it should be smooth and it should be easy, it should be full of joy rather than fear and hardship. So, but in this life, there are different conceptions. Lawful provisions, some said, uh, Auf ibn Abdullah, for instance, he says, Man ata'ullahu al-Islam, wa man ata'ullahu al-Islam, wa quran wa ahlan, wa malan, fa qad utiya fi dunya hasan, wa fi al-akhirat hasan. The man, 
or the person who is blessed in this life with Islam, the religion of Islam, the Quran, the ability you have the link with the Quran, well, uh, family, ahlan, you have a family, and you're blessed with a family, not everyone has that. Well, and you have wealth, some degree of wealth. You have these four things, Islam, Quran, family, and wealth, and you have everything. You have everything, all the good of this dunya and all the good of the Akhar. So, Imam Qurtubi said, هَذِهِ الْآيَةَ مِنْ جَوَامِ الْدُعَامِ الَّذِي عَمَّتِ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخَرِ This is the most comprehensive du'a that you can make because it covers everything of this dunya and the next life. So, in this, the final thing I want to say, and what's the difference between al-hasana and hasanatan? So in this du'a we say, رَبَّنَا أَتْنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا hasanatan versus al-hasana. Al-Hasana means this specific good. Al is a specific thing, right? It's a definite article. When you say Hasanatan, you just mean good in general. So Hasanatan is more ambiguous than Al-Hasana. Al-Hasana is very specific. Hasanatan is ambiguous. So how does that fit here in Dua? And why is it better in this Dua? Because when you leave it to Allah, has an element of tawakkul and trust in Allah. Imagine someone making dua, oh Allah give me this, this and this. Oh Allah, I want a red car, I want a house that's 20,000 square feet, I want your husband that's six foot four or with a six pack, who has a six figure salary, who's working in this company, who's this, this, this. You have such specific things, that's one way of asking Allah. But another person asked Allah and he said, oh Allah, you know better than me. Ya Allah, you know my state better than I know my state. You know what's good for me. Ya Allah, give me something that will make me happy in this life and the next life. Give me, um, you know, such and such so I can be satisfied here. So if you make it ambiguous, you make dua that's more ambiguous, you leave it to Allah, that's better other with Allah as a than asking for specific, this, 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 like a list, like a shopping list. So that's what we're doing in this dua. Hasanatan rather than al hasan. So that's a subtle insight here that uh, one of the Mufassirin, he said they are polite enough, these believers are polite enough not to specify the type of reward they seek, but to be content with whatever Allah grants them. His generosity is neither withheld nor delayed. The temperate and reasonable tone of their prayer assures them success in a generous response of Allah So these are some of the things we can learn from this great passage I'm going to introduce your remarks about the idea that dua is everything that we have. It's the conclusion of our worship. It's the fruit of our worship. That's why the Prophet said, Ad-du'a huwa al-ibadah. Dua is the essence of worship. And also we learn to make dua generally, make dua in general. Uh, to learn how to trust Allah, ask Allah for good in, in your life. Because sometimes you don't know what good is. Sometimes there's something you're facing, you want a job. But that job is going to be bad for you. We can't see everything. So if we insist on oh, Allah just give me this particular job, it might be bad for you, or this particular spouse, or there's like, you know, there's a rishta, or there's something you're looking at one particular person, and you really want that to happen, but you don't know that if it's good for you, you don't know what's going to happen in the future. It's better to trust in Allah, it's better to phrase the language in a general way that is more in conformity with the other of dua. So these are some of the things that we're going to learn in the next few weeks, inshallah. Look at some of the great supplications of the Qur'an in order to learn the wisdom and the insight of what Allah wants to teach us. And really these du'as in the Qur'an, it's not, they're not meant to be memorized and said like that. But they're teaching us so much about what they mean. If you focus on the meaning, that's what's really what Allah wants. They're not like magical formula, you say this particular verse, read it exactly as it is, without understanding of love will give you. No. They're meant to be said with meaning, with understanding. And that is why there's ibadah, dhikr, and du'a. Du'a always begins with dhikr. Why? Because dhikr means to remember Allah. That means one of the insights we learned there is that du'a requires presence of mind, not absence of mind. Dua is not something you say, reading something you don't understand. That's not dua. That's silliness. 
Reading something you don't understand is not du'a. Du'a, when you're asking Allah, you don't know what you're asking. That's really silly. That really makes no sense. It's not logical. That's why everything in the Qur'an doesn't teach you that. It teaches the opposite. It teaches you make dhikr. Dhikr has a broader meaning of remembering Allah, being present. And you, you begin the du'a with remembering Allah, and then you make du'a. That means you're supposed to know what you're saying. You're supposed to make du'a with presence of mind, not with absence of mind. So there are many things we can do. Think about that in your life, to increase that presence of mind in your du'a. Du'a should be personal. Du'a should be individual. Uh, one of the problems with group du'a, you know, group du'a, it's, it's not forbidden, it's not haram to make group du'as, but when you make group du'as, and everyone's saying, Ameen, you know, most people are not understanding what the, the Imam is making du'a for. Uh, I'm not saying it shouldn't be done, but it's just, that's not the best way to make du'a. The best way to make du'a, you raise your hands, you make worship, and you do it in the middle of the night, with no one around you, and the last third of the, why is it du'a the last third of the night? Because that's a time where you're not around with any other people. That's where you're alone with Allah. That's the best du'a that you can make when you're individual, you're alone with Allah, you have presence of mind, and you're in a state of humbleness before Allah That's all I have for today. And if there are questions or comments, specifically on this passage, and uh, I'll be happy to take some questions. We are really delighted to have you, Dr. Abu Zid, with us tonight and the subsequent nights, inshallah. Just a couple of points come to my mind. Uh, one of the richest people, I was talking to him in elderly, and he said, I am asking Allah for two things. So I said, what are those things? He said, seen was those are two letters in Arabic language. I said, okay, what is seeing and what is saw? He said, seeing is set. Saw is the sahha. Sahha means health. So he's asking for health. Set. The best I could come up with in English is protection of Allah or guidance. Or... So those are the two things you know, he advised me. So that's the first point. And then the second point, and then I will give the, you know, this scene for uh, Dr. Abuze for any comments. Uh, SubhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us in this sequence, as you mentioned. The first one is to humble ourselves and to come down to earth. And in the meantime, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the beginning, or around verse 30, 35 in Surah Al-Baqarah, He told the human being and the humanity their value on earth, that Allah has chosen the Adam as the representative for all humanity and honored him by knowledge and teaching and the other honor given to all humanity that he made all the angels to go down to, uh, to Adam. So just wanted to bring those two points and I would like to hear your comments about them. Jazakallah khair, that was a very insightful to your brother um, I think the, the first part where you ask somebody like what's the best du'a to make or who. So it's very interesting. Everyone should have a personal connection with du'a. So this particular brother, who was, who was the brother? That was an elderly. Okay, you know, it was an elderly brother in the community. He passed away many years. Uh, Allah I was a teenager at that point. Oh, no, no. <laughs> so our brother was a teenager. He asked an elderly person and he said he's making du'a for the letter seen and saw. That's so beautiful. Everyone has a personal connection for him in his life. 
There's something that made him make dua for satr and sihra. Sihra is help, but satr is like covering your fault. I think it's more probably you want to, that's something beautiful. You want Allah to cover your faults. You don't want to be taken to task for everything that you did. All of us commit mistakes. So satr is the idea of Allah covers ourselves, our faults, so He doesn't expose us. The opposite of satr is to be exposed. So that particular brother, may Allah have mercy on him, who passed. This is what he was making dua for, he remembered it by seeing and saw. So every one of us, you shouldn't be asking each other what's the dua you should make. You should make dua yourself. You should learn the Qur'anic du'as and supplications and come up with something interesting, something you know personal, something that really, because every single one of us is different. We have different inclinations, different personalities, and we're at different stages in our lives when we have different needs. So all of us have different focuses. Uh, we should have different focus for our du'as and supplications. Yes. So before bed be a good time to do du'a since we're alone? Yeah, so before going to bed. So, so du'a actually is, falls under dhikr, remembering Allah, but it's a specific form of remembering Allah. So you have dhikr and du'a. So Islam teaches us the different stages of our life to remember Him. So when we wake up, we remember Allah, and part of that remembrance is making du'a. When we go to bed before we sleep, we should make du'a. So there are all these different du'as that the Prophet وسلم, used to make. There's a chapter in that book, Fun al Dikri wa Du'a. That chapter is entitled, One Day, 24 Hours in the Life of the Prophet وسلم. So Imam al-Ghazali shares like some of the du'as of the Prophet وسلم, that he made in his particular day, waking up during the day, while eating, going to bed. So yes, all those moments are moments where you should make du'a. Any question? Yes, your sister. Oh, okay, the second part, I forgot. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, if you just reflect on what I said, you know, we taught in this, Allah is raising you up. That's something incredible. It shows you, like, you know, Allah wants to bring you up and elevate you to the heavens. And actually, when Allah raises you, He doesn't bring you to the angels, He brings you above the angels. That's what Allah wants. The believer who remembers Allah, the believer who prostrates to Allah, he's not angelic. He is better than the angels. Because the angels don't have free will, they're commanded, they're good. But the believer is better than the angels. That's a great status, something amazing. Allah says in the Quran, Wala qad bani We have gave honor, we have given honor to uh, embrace and as the brother mentioned, Allah commanded the angels to bow down to Adam. That was a symbolic uh, demonstration of, you know, the believer that worships Allah is higher than the angels. And, and the human being that does not worship Allah, or rejects Allah, is worse than the animal. So that's the, the range of human status, right? We can be the worst of the worst, but we can be better than all of creation. So that is something amazing. Allah chose the human race, Allah chose us for this great potential and He didn't choose any other race or any other creation or any other aspect of creation. So, definitely that is definitely true. Jazakallah khair for bringing that. Just as a follow-up, uh, I would remind myself, and especially the youth, the value of being a human being and being honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and chosen specifically, that in itself is a big status and an honorable status and we have to be proud to be a human being and to worship Allah as he should be worshipped. Yeah, Anything else? Any comments?
comments on the dua in your local language, in English or in Arabic? What's the significance, any difference, anything? Yeah, so the question about there are different languages and local languages. So Allah is the one who created languages. Uh, Allah says, وَاخْتِلَافُ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ Allah mentions the different languages that people speak as a sign of Allah. When Allah mentions something as an ayah, as a sign of Allah, it means it's something great, it's a validation of that. So the existence, the existence of multiple languages in the world is a great miracle and a sign of Allah's power and Allah's uh, ability and Allah's great creative ability in the world. And with that in mind, when you make dua, of course it should be in the language that you understand. So all of our dua should be uh, in our own language. There's nothing wrong with making dua in the language that you speak uh, that's closer to your heart. Uh, at the same time, the Quran is in Arabic and we make salah in Arabic. So we should learn uh, to make some du'as in Arabic, especially the salah, uh, their afkar and du'as that we make. Uh, it's, you should learn at least that much to make at least some of the rituals that we do in the Arabic uh, language as the Prophet did. Uh, but as a stepping stone, someone who embraces Islam new and obviously he doesn't know Arabic and from day one he won't be able to pray. So many scholars like Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala you allow people to even make salah in their own language. So it's uh, salah in your own language is allowed and it's valid. Because the ultimate language is from Allah Azza wa Jal. But obviously the sunnah is to make salah in Arabic, to recite the Quran in Arabic. So this should be used uh, until a person or while a person is learning or has the goal of learning the Arabic to at least perform the rituals, the salah, and to recite the Quran in Arabic. But in your personal du'a, you can make them in any language. There's no extra virtue of making them in Arabic. You can make them in your own language. Allah uh, Thank you. Okay, inshallah, we'll uh, break for today and uh, we'll uh, have our next session, inshallah, next Wednesday after Maghrib. Jazakallah uh, khair. Thank you.